Hey, what's up? It's Phoenix, and welcome back to my channel. I encourage you to hit that like button, to share with your friends, and to subscribe for more quality content from Phoenix. I'm very excited because today I'm going to talk about the notion of mimesis and the philosophy of art in the context of Platonic theory. And this is all part of my Philosopher series. You can find more of my episodes in my Philosopher series on the playlist tab, so be sure to check that out for other videos. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Now, you might be wondering what the word mimesis means, and this is a valid question. Mimesis is defined as mimicry or imitation, and it is often used in the context of art. And I will describe this idea in more detail to give you a picture of what Plato is talking about. Now, when Plato is talking about the notion of mimesis, he is saying that a poem or a painting or something of that nature is imitating reality. And if you remember the whole notion of the forms, which you can find on previous videos in my philosopher series on Plato, you will remember that a form is the ultimate expression of something. It's the kind of abstract expression of that thing. So for example, the form of a couch is the perfect couch, while the actual copy or the thing in the world, the, the real couch, so to speak, is a copy of that form. But there is one more distinction to be drawn, and this is in the context of the scathing view of Plato in terms of what he thinks about art, such as poetry and painting, and that is that it is an imitation of an imitation. So if someone, for instance, paints a picture of a couch, that is already an imitation of the actual couch, but then the couch itself is an imitation of the form, e.g. the perfect couch, and so you're actually twice removed. And this is a very troubling implication for art and for what art represents. And the reason is because it assumes that art is not true, that art is twice removed from being real. And so it's literally a copy of a copy or an imitation of an imitation. And this can be a very difficult thing to try to analyze. Is Plato literally saying that art is fake, that art doesn't actually express anything real? This is very valid to ask, and we will delve into this a little bit deeper. Now, one text that you can read to analyze some of Plato's arguments is the book Ion, Ion of which is a character in the dialogue talking with Socrates. And very briefly, I will describe what that dialogue is about. So the dialogue speaks very briefly of Socrates talking with Ion about art and poetry. Ion is basically the, a reciter of Homer, Homer of which was the author of the Odyssey and the Iliad. And this is true, really great poetry, not just even for Greeks, but in general, in world literature. Homer is great. But, as you see with Socrates analyzing Ion and Ion's arguments, you see very much that Socrates is very questionable. It, it, Socrates very much questions the notions of poetry. And so the only way that Socrates can literally justify poetry is by thinking of how it is basically divine. Otherwise, to use the example of mimesis, it is an imitation of an imitation, it is fake, it is not moral, which is another argument that Plato has against art. And these are the things that Ion and Socrates are debating. And it, it, gets, it gets complicated very fast because it seems as though there is a lot related to these notions of art as not being a real thing, as not being valuable, as being immoral, as being fake. And how the only way that you can justify it is by it being some kind of representation of the divine, otherwise it is immoral. And this is a very strong and harsh argument, and it often fits very neatly with the theories of mimesis that Plato has. Now what do we do with this? Is a copy of a copy really that fake? Well, this is something to think about. 
because one thing that you wonder is, is art itself, such as painting, poetry, or fiction, or plays, is it really imitating reality, so to speak? Now, I will admit that I'm very skeptical of this claim. I actually don't think that the purpose of art is to represent reality all of the time. When you think of Richard Rorty, you think of how, in his book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, how the mind is not necessarily perfectly equipped to mirror the world, and that the terms that we use do not have to necessarily relate to reality as it is. This is true for the mind, according to Rorty, and by using this argument as an analogy, we could say that art does not have to represent reality at all. Now, this may challenge some of our common sense notions about reality. When we watch a movie, we want to see reality as it is, but even just thinking of the notion of fantasy or science fiction, do we want it to really represent reality? I'm not so sure. When I think of 20th century art, for example, with the pressures of medium and media, such as the, the camera, we see that there are reasons why we shouldn't have to convey in our writing, for example, in our poetry, as an example, why it has to be so pure of an expression of reality. And as you get with artists like Pablo Picasso, you start to see that Pablo Picasso is not necessarily painting reality to be exact. It's not a reproduction. It's not a representation. It's more of a metaphor. And you get this with the notion of cubism, as you can imagine, with the complicated, almost convoluted shapes that Pablo Picasso uses. And Pablo Picasso is a great example of this. Art in that way does not have to be imitative. And I would even argue that after the Renaissance, a lot of art becomes very fragmented and less related to reality in very complicated ways. You get this particularly with Romanticism and beyond, where you get the notion that it's more about an expression of feeling, it's more about an internal realm and an internal point of view rather than just representing reality. Even the artistic movement Mannerism, which was right after the great artists and artistry of the Renaissance, such as with Michelangelo and the Statue of David or, and, or the Sistine Chapel, as well as Leonardo da Vinci's very accurate real-life paintings, that was less important with something like Mannerism, which was focused very much on art that deals with abstracted and convoluted and complicated, almost twisted shapes, and how the point wasn't to just represent reality as it is. So these are a couple counterexamples to Plato's idea that art has to be imitative. Granted, Leonardo da Vinci, as an example, put a lot of work into making the scale of art and of art in general, of making it more realistic, but that has not always been the point. And when I read something by Homer, I'm not necessarily reading it because I need to have an exact reproduction of reality. I'm reading it because I want the expression, I want the feeling, I want the drama, I want the chaos. But Plato takes these arguments a step further, and he assumes that, as I've stated, they are immoral, and he argues that they are immoral because they mislead people. So if you watch, for example, a horror movie, and someone says that you're bad for watching such violence, then that would be a platonic argument to say that the art itself is making you bad. And that's what Plato often argues, which is, for example, poetry and plays are representing these really violent, gruesome, but also immoral things and events, and how that makes it very problematic, because you shouldn't necessarily be engaging with these things. Now, I will argue against this point as well, that this is also seemingly not true to me, because I think that actually the function of art, as opposed to this general argument by Plato that assumes that art makes you bad, is that art actually gives you a perspective. I think art expands your perspective and gives you a different way of looking at the world, and it gives you a way in which you can talk about it. And this is all art. I think more specifically for the literary arts, but also in painting and visual arts, and even in film, and, and also drama. I think that it gives you a framework. And this framework, in my mind, is absolutely imperative and important to thinking about aspects in the world, aspects in your own life, understanding your own psyche, and it doesn't have to mirror on exactly for you to find meaning. Often when we retreat to fantasy as an example, or to fiction, 
we retreat to it because we want to escape reality. We don't want to know exactly the way reality is. There's science for that, right? Science is what tells us about facts, about the world. But art is an escape. Art is an outlet. Art is an expression. And as you will see when I talk about later philosophers such as Aristotle, there is definitely a relationship to all of these things that I'm describing that art is about freedom. Art is about having a framework from which to view the world. So the last point that I want to touch on in terms of this idea of mimesis, of mimicry, of imitation, is that Plato really imagined for his Republic a stratified society. The ultimate arbiters of truth and the ultimate arbiters of reality and the gatekeepers of reason are not the poets, but the philosophers, which could be referred to as the philosopher kings. And the philosophers who use reason to come to conclusions about the world are the most realistic and the best equipped to deal with the complicated aspects that we often deal with in reality and in society and in government. And so Plato very much imagines a stratification of, of culture and of society, and he would in fact argue that we should banish the poets, which is again a very strong claim. And as you know from watching my series, Plato often deals a lot with notions of truth. And the reason why he is also skeptical of poetry is because poetry to him doesn't represent truth. It doesn't tell you what is true about the world. It is strictly lies or complicated representations of things that don't track for our minds and for our goals and for our politics. Now, to close off this video, I would like to say that as you could tell from my video, I am very skeptical of these notions of mimesis, but they have been influential for how we think about media and how we think about the world and the engagement with art. And so that's the question I want to pose to you. What is the purpose of art? Is the purpose of art to show us about the world, show us things about the world, and to show us wonderful things about the world, and to show us what the world is? Or is art a distraction? Is art something that prevents us from seeing things in the world? Is art a medium that is not always accurate and therefore misleads people? Or is there even a middle way, which is that art can sometimes be a problem if it is depicting things that are too immoral or that are too outside of our realm of experience, but also having cultural value in that it shows us things about the world and about ourselves that give us a framework from which to view things. I don't know. These are just some ideas. So definitely a lot to think about. I definitely encourage you to check out my other videos on my channel, and I'm very glad that you stopped by today. Be sure to check out the Philosopher series, and that about wraps up my talk for today on the theory of mimesis. So definitely keep a lookout for future content and for future videos in the Philosopher series. And yeah, this is Phoenix, and I will see you next time.